All right, so uh, next up we have Matt LaPan from Millennium. We'll talk about OFDM and GNU Radio. Hello? Okay, cool, we're good. <coughs> All right, so Ben wanted me to say this presentation is actually not export controlled. Uh, PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint template, sorry. Um, <coughs> so my name is Matt LePan. Uh, I'm here with uh, one of the sponsors, Millennium Space. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about OFDM and GNU Radio, uh, maybe as I see it. Uh, if I had known that I was going after the guy that's giving out $2 million, I would have asked Ben to switch me in the schedule. But that's okay. Um, <clears throat> so, a quick background about myself. Uh, I finished my PhD a couple years ago at Virginia Tech, studied under uh, Dr. Clancy, who was the keynote this morning, and uh, did a lot of research in OFDM. Now, I work in Millennium Space and working on actually implementing OFDM in a modem that we're going to you know, send to space. So, let's get right into it. Um, things I want to talk about basically, theoretical OFDM, TXRX. Just give everyone a little bit of background. I know that we're kind of varying knowledge levels uh, coming in. Uh, take a look, a uh, quick look at OFDM and GNU Radio, what exists there now. There's plenty of great stuff already uh, in the base project. Uh, talk about timing synchronization and equal, equalization is kind of maybe two areas where there's room for improvement or, or where I kind of see some challenges. So, um, <clears throat> so OFDM, OFDMA. In a nutshell, uh, it's, the acronym is Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing, uh, Multiple Access. So it's um, basically a way for users to collaborate and share chunks of the spectrum in a frequency division multiplexing, mul multiple access sense. Um, <clears throat> it's a multi-carrier modulation, multiple access scheme uh, that's basically based on using uh, Fourier transform as a channelizer. and um, it's many instances of single carrier digital data, so BPSK, QPSK, QAM, all the stuff that we're used to sent <coughs> on different subcarriers modulated using uh, an FFT, basically. It's nice because we like FFTs and they can be computationally efficient. Um, it's using many modern comm systems. Uh, DB, I, I, you can Wikipedia this, I just Wikipedia a couple quick ones. DVB-T, 802.11, 802.16e, and the LTE downlink is one that we uh, know is pretty popular. So. There's some features and challenges and just kind of general things that I uh, wanted to talk about with, uh, in terms of OFDM. Um, it's spectrally efficient. Uh, it's, it's, it's nice just because in inherently the way that uh, the FFT algorithm works, we, when we start to have multiple carriers and multiple users, we get a little bit more uh, spectral efficiency than using a traditional FDMA scheme. Um, there's uh, frequency domain equalization is inherent because since and once we get into block diagrams, it'll make more sense if you're not sure what I'm talking about exactly. But um, <clears throat> since we are using an FFT, we're kind of by nature going back and forth from the time domain to the frequency domain, and we get to use frequency, dom frequency domain equalization, which is, which is uh, a nice benefit. Um, it's sensitive to frequency offset and Doppler, and you have to be very careful uh, during synchronization. And then uh, there's also high peaked average power ratio, so this is like a drawback. Um, you know, there's kind of times when OFDM can be great, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, and there's times when it can't be so great. Uh, but it is useful to point out that, you know, there's a, OFDM is, is kind of a building block for things like SCFDMA and a couple fancy, you know, 5G, bi-layer modulations um, that are coming down the pipe. So it's really the, kind of the base theory is good to understand and know as, you know, someone who's doing digital comms. Um, also, your friends will think you are cool, depending on who your friends are. Um, so that's nice. Um, so conceptual OFDMTX. So <clears throat> basically this is the baseband bits in, IQ out, and this is the way I see it. And it's a generic block diagram, you know, the implementation can, can vary. Uh, but there's some sort of digital modulator, that's where your, your, your QPSK happens, for instance. Um, there's carrier mapping to basically say that we're going to transmit these data carriers on these bins. And then there's an IFFT. Now, we also like to add pilots in here to help us with equalization, sync words to, add, uh, to, help, or sync words to help us with synchronization, uh, things like that. So we basically go in from building this waveform in the, in the frequency domain, time domain waveform comes out, cyclic prefix gives us some nice features that helps us uh, 
on the receive side. And then basically, so I, like I said, I'm not even following my own block diagram. The framer at the end would have the sync words um, and then the data words, but again, it, it, the implementation kind of varies. Um, so conceptual OFDMRX, uh, there's some sort of synchronization that happens out front. You have to know when you're actually receiving data um, and not just noise or garbage. Uh, and then you basically go with the uh, FFT into the frequency domain. I think, did I say FFT on the last one? Yeah, that's an IFFT. This is an FFT. Um, so then we perform kind of equal, equalization in the frequency domain, one of our nice features. We do carrier demap demapping, we get our QPSK out, uh, and then we can do digital demod and get back to bits. Um, okay, cool. So if everyone's kind of with me on that, then uh, this is a quick tour of, uh, well, I guess I should say, is everyone with me on that? Are there any of the questions before I kind of push into GNU Radio? Okay, good. Um, so a quick tour of OFDM and GNU Radio. These are the blocks that I literally just dragged uh, from the, uh, the OFDM module or GR Digital. Uh, so this, this is what's available, and there's a lot of nice tools already set up to basically get you going. I mean, you can, in, in two minutes, set up a flow graph doing an OFDM, TX, and SIM. Um, becomes a little bit more difficult once you want to actually build something maybe on hardware or you want to build a working modem end-to-end. Uh, -end. So that's kind of what is like the motivation for this talk. Uh, so these are the blocks that I'm going to talk about today. So if any of the blocks that are grayed out you're really interested in, I'm sorry. Um, but these are the blocks I want to focus on, mostly because they're a little bit um, more lower level for a number of reasons. They're a little bit lower level. Most of them are, are kind of the modular kind of basic, basic blocks that you need um, for an OFDM implementation. And they're the blocks I know, which is really the most important thing uh, in terms of why I'm going to talk about them. So uh, timing synchronization is the first thing. So uh, kind of to delve back into a little bit of background about myself, I did a lot of research uh, with OFDM synchronization um, in, in my graduate work. And I got hired by Millennium, went into industry, and I was like, OK, it's time to build an OFDM modem. So, you know, I should just drop in a couple blocks. It should be pretty straightforward. Well, so I found some things that maybe could be improved on or maybe or kind of challenges depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, and I just kind of want to touch on those things and then, you know, open up for discussion after that. So uh, for timing synchronization, there's various synchroni synchronization algorithms that will work. Um, many are based on like a po super popular paper uh, by Schmidl and Cox. It's like referenced there at the bottom of the paper. This is a lot of my bulk of my graduate research was based on that paper. Uh, it's what's used in like WiMAX, I think, uh, and a couple other places. Variants, uh, th th there's a couple little uh, kind of flavors of the algorithm out there. But at, at the base, it's, it's a correlation-based metric that allows you to do timing synchronization and then frequency synchronization. And it's also just a really good paper in general. Uh, if you're not familiar with OFDM synchronization, great place to start. Um, <clears throat> so there's actually a GR implementation of this block. So I, I, I kind of lied a little bit when I said that uh, all the blocks that I'd be talking about are low level and modular. That's actually a higher block. Um, but underneath, it's, it's built up of a lot of modular blocks that it's a pretty, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively complicated algorithm, and it's kind of wrapped up and packaged uh, nicely in, in this one higher block. But it's really straightforward. Uh, the, code is, the, the code's here. I just took a snippet of, uh, of the Python, uh, or let's see, I should look on my screen. Anyways, I took a snippet of the higher block, and it's really straightforward to kind of understand the way that this algorithm works relative to the paper. Um, so the, uh, the biggest problem that we found when we first tr tried to implement like a transmit receiver pair is that there's a little bit of a, there's a little bit of issue with the, uh, with the timing metric. So going back to kind of my first slide, actually I'll just check back right here. Going back to the slide about the RX, the very first thing we have to do is synchronization. So as a receiver, we need to say, okay, when's the, when's the data actually coming in? What's the first sample that I take as my OFDM frame? And since we are doing this in, one thing I didn't write here is, you know, bits coming in and baseband data coming out is going in a serial fashion. FFT operates on a, an n number of samples at a given time. So there's a, a serial pa parallel element in there. When we're, when we're doing timing synchronization, we need to be make sh making sure that we're taking the exact right data to be feeding to each FFT. So that's kind of what timing synchronization is all about. And so if you miss, you're going to end up missing a whole frame which 
is a problem if, if you want to build a reliable modem. Um, so kind of found a little bit of issue there um, with the, the Schmidl and Cox timing estimate. Um, and so let me see. I can go into here. A little more detail. So the plateau detector operates uh, on a number of input items. Um, there's kind of a known bug that we found at an edge case uh, when a plateau is split up. So you can imagine uh, the, the, the plateau detector block that's underlying this, uh, this, this uh, synchronization block takes in a number of input items. Uh, it's computing across this metric uh, in the last, it's called M of D in the paper, but this is a plateau metric and basically the modem's looking for a point along that plateau. It says this is the start of a frame. As long as we're on that plateau, we're good. So uh, we found a known bug where if the, the items of that plateau that get passed in split the plateau in half. So you can imagine the scheduler passes something like from here to here and then from here to here. You're either gonna grab two, you're gonna grab two timing points or you're gonna grab none. Uh, that's a problem. You end up dropping a frame or you demodulate a garbage frame. Uh, so that, that, that doesn't work very well. Um, so basically, there, there, there's, a, there's that issue that kind of needs to be dealt with if you're looking to do a, a realistic implementation here. And then <clears throat> additionally, there's uh, some modifications to the algorithm that can improve the robustness of the timing estimate. So the plateau detector itself can be um, a little bit tricky the way that it's implemented now, but there's also maybe better ways to get uh, a time, oh, sorry. There's also maybe better ways to get a, uh, a, a, a timing point that's a, a little bit more robust. So I actually cited one example paper uh, of something that we tried out. Um, there's gonna be additional trade-off, added computational complexity, a priori knowledge, or something. But there are ways to kind of improve the algorithm. In certain, and in certain cases, synchronization gets a little bit harder and you wanna make sure that like, you're grabbing the frames that you, you think you are. Um, so that was, that, that was kind of one area. Uh, and actually, uh, one of our interns like, found this bug and was able to fix it, so that, that was pretty cool. Um, so then the next, the next kind of area that we saw an issue uh, was OFDM frame equalization. This uh, is a little bit more disconcerting, I think. Um, basically, so the way that the, the OFDM frame EQ works is that the equal, equalizer makes use of a priori information uh, to obtain channel estimate. It, it uses pilots or in some cases, uh, one of the preamble symbols, which is just can be thought of as a symbol of pilots. Um, <clears throat> so the way that uh, OFDM frame structure works, uh, basically laid out based on the paper, is that there's two preamble symbols, and then you have a, a bunch of data symbols, and that makes a frame. So <clears throat> preamble symbol two can be used to determine the entire uh, channel at the beginning of the frame. This has to do a little bit like getting into the paper. Basically, preamble symbol one uses every other subcarrier. You can kind of see up there on the top right. Uses every other subcarrier. So in the frequency domain, if you go to the time domain, do a Fourier transform, the identity is that that becomes time repeating. That's basically so that we can correlate the symbol against itself at the receiver. Preamble symbol two, however, is used more for coarse frequency estimation. And so every subcarrier is populated. So you're actually characterizing your entire channel with a symbol that you already know. So kind of a good idea to maybe take that symbol at the beginning of the frame and say, here's my channel estimate on every, at every subcarrier, every tap that I, uh, that I can measure it, and then use that uh, throughout the frame. So <clears throat> there's also the concept of pilots that are interspersed like throughout each symbol, uh, each of the data symbols that can be used to, uh, to update those channel estimates. So those can be, you know, th th those can be fixed in frequency as kind of like a kind of a comb uh, type type estimator or they can change uh, where they, what subcarriers they are uh, throughout the frame. So it's kind of two ways to do it. So the frame equalizer block, um, kind of based on what we saw in GNU radio, is, is an almost generic equalizer block. So this thing uh, basically just is a wrapper for an equalizer object that takes in, uh, that, that takes in something that says, hey, use this preamble symbol to equalize, use these pilots, just do it this way. So I mean, really, I mean, the code in there is like, get taps, equalize, output. Um, so the phase correction um, is correct. Uh, the phase correction, there's a phase correction in here that happens that's computed according to one. So th this is the first problem that we really found. Uh, basically, when, when the OFDM symbols come out of the receiver, 
you do your equalization, you do your course frequency, well, you do your course frequency correction first, you do your equalization, and this block was actually responsible um, for, in, for, for it correcting from an artifact from the course frequency estimation in the equalizer. So what happens is you do a course, fre you, you, you do a course frequency correction, you're off by a couple of subcarriers, you shift your subcarriers back into their correct bins, and then you uh, basically take your, uh, you can send, sorry, you can send the data into the equalizer. So <clears throat> what happens when you do that is because of this, uh, the, the cyclic prefix strip, you're left with a little bit of a phase artifact, right? There, there's a constant phase term on each of the symbols, and it's very deterministic, and it's very um, easy to correct based on what your course frequency offset was. But what happens here in the OFDM implementation is that phase correction is done in the equalizer block. Now, there's a little bit of an issue with that. The issue being, if you're using an equalizer that uses pilots, the pilots are also going to estimate that constant phase term. They're going to measure that because it's just a constant multiplied across the whole symbol. So each pilot is going to have some e to the j, whatever term uh, that it estimates as part of its, uh, as part of doing its job. So if that happens, then this block actually is kind of double correcting that error and you're going to end up with, you're going to end up with phase error and, and the demodulators are going to work, which is one of the things that we found out immediately. So if you're using uh, the preamble symbol two to do your equalization, it's no worries. It's like we just took the channel estimate once and then this phase term only shows up on every symbol after that, so we're kind of good to go. If you start using pilots, that's kind of an issue. And one of the problems is when we first tried to implement this modem, we saw, okay, we're using, we're definitely using a pilot-based estimator. Let's just kind of, because it was, it was what was available to us, so we threw it in there and we saw it wasn't working. We saw it wasn't working and this was one of the things that we found. Um, so <clears throat> to talk a little bit more about the equalizer objects, uh, currently the, the EQ objects do not interpolate. So when I say that, I mean the ones that uh, are using pilots. Uh, so they rely on the preamble channel estimate and then they just update. So they all use a zero forcing equalizer, which is basically just what's my received symbol over what's my transmitted symbol, H equals Y over X to estimate the channel. Uh, that's good enough in many cases, uh, but better options are out there, MMSC or ML for any of you guys that are familiar with uh, estimation theory. So that's one area for improvement where we can kind of get some better updated equalizers, uh, equalizer objects that have uh, interpolation schemes in them or anything like that. Um, another, an, another area that we found, so the first equalizer that we tried to drop in was the decision feedback equalizer. And I, <laughs> we, had, we had huge issues with that because we actually found that this equalizer assumes high SNR, which in many cases for many of the problems that we face, that's a bad assumption. Uh, so what it's actually doing is it takes, this, it takes the value that's received on every subcarrier forces it to some constellation point. It's basically uh, like, a, like an ML estimator that you would use for QPSK. So it, it'll force it to a QPSK symbol and then take the value that it was over the, the value that it forced it to and, and basically use your data subcarrier as a pilot. That's not a good assumption if you have really any channel effects at all, if you have uh, low SNR conditions or anything like that. Uh, so that's, that's, a huge, that's a huge problem, and if you kind of go in expecting this to work right out of the box, you're, you're going to be, you're going to be upset. <laughs> um, so leading into that, I, I want to talk about one, one thing, uh, like timing acquisition as a channel effect. This is one thing I think when we go to implement OFDM, we don't think about very often. Um, so I kind of want to get through this because I feel like people might have questions and I, wa I want to have time for that. But... Uh, going back to my block diagram, like at the beginning for the TX side, you see that we do all this stuff, IFFT, we go to the time domain, and then we add a cyclic prefix. So when we do that, we call it a cyclic prefix, we actually end up taking usually from the end of the symbol, and we just copy and paste like right to the beginning of the symbol. Uh, the problem is, going to this timing plateau, let's say that we take a timing point over here on the left. Well, Okay, we still have the same data, right? But it's rotated in time. Uh, and that, rotated, that rotation in time has an effect in, in the frequency domain. Um, so that's kind of what I pointed out over here on the right. So that x of t mi minus c is actually looks like a time delay, which is a phasor modulation in the frequency domain. So decision fee feedback equalizer doesn't really account for that. It's like, oh, okay, well, the symbol that I'm getting in is 
basically I'm expecting it to be right, so I can just use this as a pilot. When really, <coughs> you can see this is just a quick Python sim that I wrote of measuring a channel uh, with preamble symbol two of, of, an, ideal t of an ideal model. There's, there's no noise, there's no multipath, there's nothing. I just take the cyclic prefix, sh take the very first timing, timing point at, uh, as my trigger point, and then, strip, and then strip the cyclic prefix from the end. That's a delay. And the channel model right there is, is complicated. It, it can, the frequency of that can basically be as high as your cyclic pre prefix length uh, is. So <coughs> if we don't think about this channel effect, like, oh, okay, the decision feedback equalizer, well, it makes sense. But the problem is, if you're using a cyclic prefix implementation, or you don't have a super robust, uh, basically, synchroniz like timing synchronization algorithm that's grabbing the same timing point, then you're kind of ignoring like the very first kind of channel effect that's possible. Uh, so this it's just kind of one thing that, that you need to think about and like take a little bit of care. Like I said, there's some great tools uh, in GNU Radio right now to help you like get up and going with OFDM. But to really like ha have this be feasible for implementing like working modems, it, there's a, there's a little bit of work to be done. Um, so other areas for development, just kind of some random. Uh, thoughts I had. Right now, the OFDM implementation in GNU Radio is frame passing. That requires huge buffers um, when you have to wait you know, for an entire frame. We ran into issues where, hey, we can't have a certain number of data symbols per frame because you have to buffer the entire frame uh, between blocks. So that would be, that, 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 that'd be kind of a nice uh, change to see in the future. Uh, more, pri more a priori information on both the TX and RX side. The, the way the blocks are set up now, it, it's kind of clever. Like the, the receiver figures a lot of the characteristics out uh, about the modem on its own. That might be great for you know, certain sensing radios or cognitive radio applications, but there's, uh, there's, also, I mean, there's also times when you just want a radio to, to do exactly what you want it to do, and you want to be able to tell the receiver, hey, this is where my data, is, like data carriers are, pilot carriers. And, th and there is some stuff in there to do that in GNU Radio, uh, but you, you can't explicitly tell about guard bands. You can't explicitly tell about FFT shift. All of that's kind of inferred by the block. So that's, that's one area. Um, and then for modularity, it'd, it'd be nice to split up uh, the channel estimate, the EQ, the course frequency estimate, the correction. That's all one block right now. And you know, the, the whole idea of this tool chain is that we want to keep things modular and flexible. So that's just kind of something that I'd like to see. But yeah, like I said, this is all how I see it. Does anybody have questions? All right, do we have questions for Matt? We have one up there. Jose, can you get to him? Sorry, can you raise your hand again? Yeah, maybe you had it on your first slide. I don't remember, but I, I assume you're using this for ground station applications. Uh, actually, we are, actually, we are not. That's why I was asking for, because I thought OFDM was for, you know, uh, uh, multipath mitigation. So, so, what use is it for you guys? I what guess. use is it for us? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, it's got a couple of uses. One of the uses is that it was my research in grad school, and I okay, kind of yeah. showed up and was like, "Hey, we should do this." Um, but it's it, it's also useful. It's it's spectrally efficient. It gives us some flexible um, kind of multiple access schemes and options like that. I can't get too much into what or why, but it, it has some uses for us. Okay. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Oh, do we have one in the back there? Hey, Martin. Hey, um, when are you submitting those patches? That's my question. So, <laughs> so that's, that's something that uh, we have discussed. We haven't spoken with you know, uh, Ben or anyone like in the GNU Radio project explicitly about it. Um, but it's, some, it, it, it's something that we are interested in, and uh, it's a little bit, you know, the nature of our work might make it a little bit difficult, but we are making a huge push uh, as a company to be a part of like this open source community as much as possible and to keep you know all of what we can kind of exposed to uh, to everyone so yeah that's well, let, let's let's talk after this okay other questions for Matt no all right Thank oh can you, I Matt. Oh. also I, I forgot to do like a shameless plug for our company oh. uh, yeah we're Millennium space we're like one of the sponsors here uh, at GRCon come check out our booth uh, Doug Chris, Mike, and Amy, it's our team in the back. We're, we're a fun bunch, so you know, come get to know us and hang out with us. We'd love to talk to any of you guys. Come work for us. You know, buy satellites from us. <laughs> All right, thank you, Matt. Cool.